മീറ്റിംഗ് ഒരു ഫൈവ് മിനിറ്റ്സ് കൂടെ കഴിഞ്ഞ് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ചെയ്യാം എല്ലാവരും ജോയിൻ ചെയ്യുന്നേ ഉള്ളൂ അപ്പൊ ഒരു അഞ്ച് മിനിറ്റ് കൂടി കഴിഞ്ഞ് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ചെയ്യണം കേട്ടോ ഹലോ എം ഐ ഓട്ടിപ്പൻ ഹലോ യെസ് ഓക്കെ
Take Heart Homes. We fabricate your dreams as real. Fabricated villas, resorts, residential homes, hotels, QSR outlets, commercial places. We blend most sophisticated technology and art. Do any arms to the nature. At the same time, contribute new petals to the serenity of nature. Fabricated house should last over 100 years. And in this respect, by no means worse off than conventionally built house. We offer completion in 100 days, 25 years of construction warranty, 30% cost reduction, 50% materials are reusable, painting with the work, UPVC windows, branded wires and other accessories. You can dream, we can make it possible. Take heart. Welcome to the day 2 of NOVA 3.0. Myself, Anita, from JRPS Todubura. Before getting started, on behalf of Team NOVA, I would like to express my heartfelt gratitude towards our sponsors, Club FM and Tcard House, whose colossal support made this event a great success. NOVA is the collaborative venture of space clubs across engineering colleges in Kerala. The first edition was conducted during the Space Week of 2020, and now we are at the third edition of NOVA. The convention includes a plug and offline events from March 26 to March 30, and finally culminating in the first ever offline NOVA gathering at Government Engineering College, Trishur. Now, I would like to invite Dr. N.J. Jalaja, Principal of Government Engineering College, Idiki, for the welcome address. Anita, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Respected resource person, Pro Professor Sarida, and dear participants of this uh, seminar. Good evening, everybody. I'm extremely happy to be a part of this program. Uh, in fact, it's a very uh, happy thing to note that NOVA is organizing a series of lectures meant for uh, students from various institutions, not only engineering colleges, various institutions in Kerala. And you have identified the right resource persons to share their experiences, expertise in this field. So uh, it's indeed a happy moment for all of us, all the students who are interested in say, learning more and more about space and uh, so many things which are unknown to us. And I'm very happy to welcome Professor Sarida Vick to this uh, session. As you all know, she's a professor at Indian Institute of Sa Space Technology, uh, She has been working there since uh, 2010. Uh, she has done her MSc in Physics from Hyderabad Central University and uh, PhD in Physics from Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. She has uh, published so many uh, say journal publications as well as two book chapters. Um, she has taught so many uh, sub courses on a variety. She has uh, taught a variety of courses. And uh, if you look into uh, her activities, outreach activities, astronomy activities and outreach activities, uh, you can see that uh, she has represented India as a team leader at the 15th International Olympiad on Astronomy and Astrophysics at uh, Georgia in 2022. And uh, if I list all of them, it will, it's, uh, that itself will take, say, I think, uh, an hour or so. So I'm not going into that. You can look into uh, her uh, faculty profile in the website of IIST. You can see that she is actively involved in teaching, research, uh, and so many outreach activities also. And uh, we are uh, privileged to have you, madam, here to talk to our children, uh, not only really from engineering colleges, but also from, uh, say, so many schools and colleges from uh, Kerala, as well as a few students from outside also. So let me welcome you, madam, to this uh, session. We are all eager to hear from you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. It is a privilege to be here. Now for the and thank you again for the nice introduction as well. So I'm happy to talk to the students anytime. Only this time it is online. Uh, that's no problem. Let's hope that we can make it as interactive as a offline session as well. So uh, how much time do I have? I want to know this. How much time do I have? In the sense that uh, till when can we go on? Uh, Ma'am, uh, you can go uh, as your comfort. Maybe one, okay. uh, one hour session and then two Fine. minutes of uh, question and answer. Okay, okay. So let me first begin to share my screen. I see how to share present now. So, can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Is it full slide now? Or oh, what happened? If you click here to return to the video call. Okay, I don't want to return to video call. Is it full screen? Can you see it? I uh, know, ma'am, it's not on the presentation. Yeah, hold on. I don't know what will happen. I went into the full screen mode and then. Yeah, is this okay? Yeah, ma'am. Yeah, can I start now? It's full yeah, screen sure. is visible, right? Yeah, this is visible. Okay, all right. So today I'm going to talk about stars, planets, and exoplanets. And so first is, what is a star? Well, I'll talk a little bit of our, about our star, the sun, and of course the solar system. Then look at, are all stars like the sun? How do stars and planets form? And what about planets around other stars? So these are some of the topics that I will be touching upon today. So let us begin the journey to stars. So what is a star? How do we define a star? So you must, high school, you must have learned about uh, star, um, definition of a star, particularly the sun and said it's a huge ball of gas and so on, plasma. But we have a specific definition of a star. Uh, according to us, an object that is spherical, first, there are these two conditions that a star should satisfy. It should be spherical or nearly so. And secondly, it should radiate energy from its interior. And this should mainly be uh, energy from nuclear reactions. Now, of course, the first question is, why should stars be spherical? Because as scientists, we have to answer, not just look at certain numbers, but also try to answer about why physic certain physical phenomena occur. So why should stars in be spherical or any cosmic object be spherical? This is because massive objects like the stars are held together by the gravitational force. Now, the gravitational force that you are all familiar with, self-gravity of the object, that is radial dependent. You know, it is, if you see the force factor, it goes as 1 by r r square so there's a radial force there which means that is it does not depend on any direction it only depends on the radius so therefore it is expected to be the same in all the directions and that's why it is symmetric or spherical in shape now if i look at this definition of star and this is the first part about it be spherical the second of course is it should radiate energy from its interior and this should mostly be nuclear energy uh, energy produced due to nuclear reaction. Now, if I look at other categories of objects like planets, asteroids, comets, we don't call these stars. And when I say we don't call these stars, you, you may ask, why don't you call them stars? Or anybody can ask. And then we go back to the definition and see which of these conditions are violated. So, for example, if you see uh, the planet Jupiter, which is shown here, it is spherical in shape, but it does not in a radiate energy due to 
nuclear reactions in the, from its interior. Now, if you look at asteroids and comets, then these are not, they don't satisfy both the conditions. They are neither spherical nor do they radiate energy from the interior. So, this is how we define a star. Now, if we look at our star, our star is the sun, which is the center of our solar system. And all the bodies which are bound to this sun comprise the solar system. So, uh, what is the sun made up of? It is made up of very, very hot gas, which is plasma. And when I say plasma, what exactly is plasma? Is it just hot gas, but if the temperatures are very high of the order of millions of degree Kelvin? So, all the matter which is present there, the gaseous matter, that, that is ionized. Okay, so you will have lots of ions and you will have lot of electrons. So, this is called plasma. Now, how far is the sun from us? The sun is, okay, I can give you in so many kilometers and uh, like here 150 million kilometers. But suppose later I ask you, tell me the distance to the sun, you will not remember this number also. One easy way to remember is in terms of light minutes. So, the sun is 8 light minutes distant from us. So, which means that it takes 8 minutes for the sun's light to reach us. So, since we know the velocity of light, we can calculate what this distance is. This distance is also known as astronomical unit. Now, the earth does not have a fully spherical orbit. It has a slight eccentricity. But if you ignore this eccentricity and consider an average distance of the earth from the sun, then it is of the order of 8 light minutes or 150 million kilometers, which is also known as AU or astronomical unit. What is the mass of the sun? How heavy is it compared to things we know? So, the mass of the sun is of the order of, see, when we go to astronomy, all the numbers start becoming very large. You'll have to start putting lots and lots of zeros that you have to start counting how many zeros you put, right? So, in the case of mass, it is 2 into 10 power 30 kilograms. Okay, which means that it is uh, 2 followed by 30 zeros. We can't even imagine this number, right? But one way to do is to through comparison. So, if you compare it with the mass of the earth, then it's 350,000 times heavier than the earth. And therefore, once we talk about astronomy, the units that we commonly use, like kilogram and all, we can use it to say the mass of the sun to people in general. But as astronomers, if we are comparing different kinds of stars, then we look at their mass in terms of the mass of the sun. So, the mass of the sun or solar mass becomes the unit for mass in astronomy. Because we cannot keep always saying 10 power 30 kilograms, 10 power 32 kilograms, 10 power 26 kilograms, because that doesn't give us a very good scale. But what we usually do is we say it is 10 solar masses, which is 10 times the mass of sun or 10 percent of the solar mass. Okay, So, that is how we proceed in uh, defining masses. Now, what about the size? We know it is very large in size and it is about, if you want to remember how much it is, then you can say it's approximately 100 times the size of the earth. And we know the size of the earth, you know the radius of the earth. So, 100 times that is the size of the sun. And what is the power that the sun gives off? Well, how much energy per unit time is the sun giving out per second? Okay. Uh, so, per unit time means in this case, we take it to be second. So, it is around 4, 10 power 26 watts. That means per second, every second it is giving off around 3.8, 10 power 26 joules of energy. So, you can understand this much energy, of course, it is being given off in all directions. This is not just on earth, but in all possible directions. Earth receives only a very small part of it. Depending on the distance, you know, of the planet, then that much energy you will receive depending on the solid angle which it subtends, okay? And this energy itself, we use it for multiple things. In fact, we attribute or we can acknowledge the life on Earth because of the radiation from the sun. Now, if we come to the solar system, there are eight planets, and I am sure all of you know about these eight planets, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and you also know a lot of uh, facts about these planets. So, I will not go into too many details about facts of these planets, what is their sizes, what is their distance and so on, because they will just be things which I can tell you some numbers which you will not remember later, right? But what I can tell you is that if you look at these planets, the composition of the planets, you see the inner ones are terrestrial in nature, right? Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And if you look at Jupiter and Saturn, they are gaseous giants. And if you look at Uranus and Neptune, they are 
IC giants. They are called IC uh, giants and they are made up of mostly ice. Now you can see that there's a temperature gradient in the sense surface temperature. If I look at these planets, Mercury is hottest because it's the closest to the sun. And as you move away from the sun, what happens to the temperature of the planet? It of course uh, goes lower and lower. Now in your school, for example, right, you must have, uh, I don't know, have that, no. In your school, see, I have marked all these planets in a straight line. Question is, are they always in a straight line like this? Or are they, do they follow? That means if, if all of them followed certain orbits, will those all orbits be in a plane? Or will they be out of plane? In your school, I'm sure you have drawn these orbits at some point of time. And you always draw them as circles or ellipses in the same plane. But have you ever thought about this question? About why the planet should always have orbits in the same plane or similar plane? Why? Of course, you know the case of Pluto, right? Pluto is a dwarf planet, so it is not a planet. And that uh, Pluto's orbit does not satisfy this. But that's not the reason why it was removed uh, from the planet category. There are diff other reasons. I'm not going into that for now. But if I look at these planets, these planets also could be having very irregular orbits, right? Uh, one could be in a, this plane, the other could be making an the orbital plane of another planet could be making an angle of 30 degrees, another could make 50 degrees with respect to plane. It could be in any random directions, but it's not. All of them are actually moving in a plane around the sun. And we'll soon come to why this is so. Because this has, uh, what do you say, implications in terms of how the planets actually formed. So if you see the extent of the solar system, here for example, if you see uh, the figure which is shown here, this is the extent of the solar system. So you can see that most of these objects, so it's not just planets which are part of the solar system. I'm sure you're aware there's an asteroid belt, then you have lots of asteroids, you have uh, even comets which are part of the solar system, and you have a really large number of icy objects. And you see, if I really look at the solar system from very far, then I see that many of these icy objects are distributed something like this in the form of a disk. And this is the same disk where all the planets are moving in the plane. Only this is the orbit of Pluto. So this disk with lots of uh, these icy objects is known as Kuiper belt. And if I go out really far, it is anticipated. We do not know. We have not measured this. But it is thought that the extent, the spherical extent of the uh, solar system will extend up to 1.6 light years, which is also known as Oort cloud. This is, of course, a hypothetical concept, and this is what we think uh, the extent of the solar system could be. Now, let us look at uh, our star, the sun, and, the, and its vital statistics. So, how is sun producing all this energy? The sun is fusing hydrogen nuclei, which is protons, to helium nucleus in the core. Okay, and its lifetime. What do I mean by lifetime? Lifetime is how long will it continue to burn hydrogen to helium in the core? As far as we know, it is forever. But there, forever does not mean infinite, infinite time or infinity. In this case, there is a first finite time. We can think of it infinity with respect to our own lifetimes. But in reality, the lifetime of the sun is very long. Of, and people calculate it. We astronomers calculate this. You can even do a rough calculation depending on how much fuel is there how much hydrogen is there in the center, what is the rate at which the hydrogen is uh, fusing to helium. And when the hydrogen, all the hydrogen at the center where the temperature is high, it fuses to helium. So that is how we calculate the uh, lifetime of the star, uh, of the star in this phase when it is fusing hydrogen to helium. And that is of the order of 10 billion years. And the current age of the sun is around 4.56 billion years. And sun and solar system is 4.56 billion years because it is believed that all the planets and the sun formed it around the same time. So we are roughly halfway between the uh, lifetime of the sun in this phase when it is fusing hydrogen to helium. Now, if I look at the surface temperature of the sun, it is of the order of 6000 Kelvin. Now, this is definitely not sufficient to fuse hydrogen to helium. Therefore, fusion, this should tell you that fusion reaction doesn't happen everywhere in the sun, doesn't happen on the surface. It actually happens where the temperature and pressure conditions are high enough for the reactions to occur. So the core temperature in the case of the sun in the very center, that's where the temperature and pressure are the highest. It is of the order of 15 million Kelvin or centigrade, you can say. And this temperature is required for the fusion of hydrogen to helium. 
if you don't have this the temperatures are much lower then it fusion reaction will not occur that's why it doesn't happen in bodies of smaller masses because there the central pressure and temperature does not reach such high uh, values where fusion reaction can be initiated so how much is the central pressure it is of the order of 340 billion earth's atmosphere now you must be seeing the sun every day right but does it become smaller because of this energy producing in the center whenever you see a nuclear bomb for example because of nuclear reactions what happens it actually explodes it explodes because lot of energy is released here also nuclear reactions are continuously occurring in the center so why doesn't the sun explode it does not become larger right it does not explode even though a lot of energy is being continuously generated within the center of the sun that is given off but it the whole sun is not exploding so the sun is able to maintain its shape you know its size does not change at all and that is because of the balance between very two important forces one is the thermal force because of the energy which is produced in the interior from the sun and the self gravity of the sun so the self gravity of the sun has this tendency to uh, come back make it smaller and the thermal pressure has the tendency to move in the opposite direction as shown here so these are continuously balanced together and therefore uh, it is in a stable state where these two are balanced together okay that is known as hydrostatic equilibrium this equilibrium is maintained that's why you do not see the size of the sun changing now suppose i switch off the nuclear reaction what would happen only self gravity will take over and it will collapse suppose for example the thermal pressure for some reason becomes so high that it becomes very much larger than self gravity then what happens then the sun will start to expand so it is just a balance of forces and energies which is causing the size of the sun or any star for that matter to remain the same now let it this is of course the case of sun now let us look at other stars in the sky with the nearest star as you know is proxima centauri which is located around 4.2 light years away and if you look at night sky for example you will see a large number of stars uh, and i hope you have looked at uh, some of these constellations the constellation shown on the left is known as the orion and it, a constellation is a pattern of stars in the sky so here for example you can see you know this person uh, this is the person this is the belt this person is a hunter this is the belt of the hunter there is also a sword he is holding an a bow and arrow he is going to shoot okay so this is known as the hunter or orion and if you look up at the night sky particularly in kerala you can see this constellation for a most parts of the year okay and of course in the night sky when you look you can't see these lines these lines are imaginary so if you will really look up at the night sky it will appear like something like this okay so this is known as a constellation a constellation are patterns of bright stars in sky at night but we must remember all these stars are not at same distance from us these stars are at different distances from us this is just a pattern it just happens that when they are projected as we see them they appear to show, show some shape but if i started traveling to one of the star for example the other stars will be much further away okay so the patterns may uh, not look the same from there okay and uh, if you also look at this on the right hand side this constellation you see this is the orion constellation this is the reddish star which is known as betelgeuse this appears bluish this is known as rigel this is a region which is known as m42 you can see this with the naked eye also this is a nebula also known as m42 nebula m stands for messier so there was this person you know called messier he was actually in, in early 19th century 20th century he was actually collecting looking up at the different parts of the night sky through the telescope and he saw these objects which were not stars they were mainly nebulae so he started cataloging them and therefore the numbers and the positions so this comes as 42nd number in that messier's catalog that's why it's known as m42 nebula now as i told you just now that some stars appear reddish to us and some stars are orangish some are yellowish some are bluish some appear whitish so what is the reason what can we understand by looking at the colors of the stars i'm not talking about planets i'm just talking about stars so colors for example tell us a lot they can tell us how hot the star is or in or rather the surface of the star is because the light that we are uh, that is reaching us 
is coming from the surface of the star which is actually the energy is coming from the center but as it travels to the surface and escapes from the surface those photons are coming from the surface so they tell us information about the surface of the star so the bluish stars are those which are very hot whose surface temperature can be as high as 50 to 60000 centigrade if you look at reddish stars they are the cold okay of the order of 3000 to 3500 centigrade and these have ma and the yellowish and orange stars for example if you look at sun as i told you its surface temperature is 6000 kelvin so that appears yellowish to us then the hotter it is it starts becoming bluish and so on and then whitish and cooler it is it starts becoming reddish and so on so the masses of the, the stars have mass in certain range okay you cannot have stars of arbitrary mass you just have stars in a certain mass range this is of the order of typically of the order of 50 to uh, 10% of the mass of the sun can also go to 100 or 200 beyond that the star cannot be assembled because the energy which will be produced will be so high that it will blow up the star so there is a certain narrow range of mass where the uh, object can produce nuclear energy and sustain itself for a certain amount of its lifetime and if the mass is less than 0.1 solar mass then it will be some kind of objects which are which do not have enough mass to fuse hydro protons to helium nucleus so they go on different kind of little less uh, other type of nuclear reaction it cannot reach up to the helium stage but it can re reach by uh, fusing some hydrogen it can produce deuterium but cannot go further in nuclear reactions those objects are known as brown dwarfs if you go even lower in mass then you come to planets okay so you have this different mass range objects okay and according to the central temperature and pressure we can decide whether nuclear reactions are occurring and therefore whether energy will be produced and it will behave like a star now how many stars are there if you look up at the sky uh, these aggregates of stars are known as galaxies and our galaxy is the milky way so our milky way for example extends up to the size of our milky way is of the order of 100000 light years and if we believe that it has of the order of 200 billion stars okay of different kinds now what the lies between the stars if you look up at the night sky you know you even if you see this picture you see that there are a lot of stars present but what is there between the stars is it completely empty or is there something there and you know the fact that you see nebulae means that it is not completely empty okay there is certain matter which is present between the stars this is known as interstellar medium and this is uh, comprises of gas which is 99% and dust 1% by mass so if i take a certain volume of interstellar medium and i weigh it the 99% of that mass will be gas and 1% will be dust dust is not the kind of dust that we see on earth for example this dust is very tiny teeny weeny of the order of um, a few hundreds of nanometers okay and it's also made up of we also know its composition and so on based on the study it is very very low density uh, the um, interstellar medium is very low density and it is lower than the best vacuum which we can achieve on earth in uh, vacuum chambers for example and it is from this medium this interstellar medium that stars form okay now if you look at the sites where stars form these are the densest regions of the interstellar medium which is shown here they are known as the molecular clouds okay and within this dense regions you will have further high density regions they are known as cores and clumps and then because of certain trigger the core or clump can start collapsing and this gravitational collapse once of this medium starts inside because of gravity the temperature can rise and okay passes through multiple phases it's a long drawn process i'm not going into the detail for simplicity i'm just saying that the gravitational potential energy is released and it gets it contracts and the temperature inside uh, can rise very high and if it rises high enough for fusion to take place then a star is born okay and as i said this is of course a very simplistic picture in reality it passes through multiple phases to reach that state so here you can see for example on the right hand side this is bernard 68 cloud it almost seems like a hole right but this is actually uh, the you are not able to see the the objects behind it because this is very dense interstellar medium it has dust as i told you and dust tends to block light 
Similarly, this is also a molecular cloud, dense molecular cloud against the diffuse background. That's why it appears to be blocking the light from behind. Initially, when people did not know about interstellar medium, they actually thought these were like holes in the sky from which you could go to parallel universe. But now we know it's not true, although we would like to believe it. So how, what happens from this formation of star to formation of solar system? How is the solar system formed? So as I said, you have this molecular cloud and this molecular cloud will undergo gravitational collapse. And if there is some slight torque which is present in the cloud, and at the same time it's contracting, then what happens? Because of conservation of angular momentum, it starts spinning up faster. So as it becomes smaller, it starts spinning up faster. Now, as it's, remember, this is uh, not a solid. What is this? This is a gaseous material. So as it is spinning up, it tends to flatten. You know, the Earth is also not completely sphere, right? It has bulge. And uh, where? Near the equator. Okay. And near the poles, it is more flattened. This is because of the rotation of Earth. So the rotation has this effect. It tends to flatten the object. So in this case, what is happening is in the center where the star is forming, that is spherical because that is very dense material. Okay. It is almost becoming like a, uh, you can think of high dense material. There it doesn't tend to flatten. But when the gas is less dense, it tends to flatten to the form in the form of a disk. So in the center, you are having this protostar, which is going on to form the star. But surrounding it, you have these gas and dust, which is in the form of a protostellar disk. Within this, you may sometimes a small planetesimals may develop. And these planetesimals will then accrete more and more matter from its surrounding. And over time, this will form planets. And what happens to the remaining gas and dust, which is they will just dissipate over time. So at the end of this process, you are left with a star at the center and a number of planets which are moving around them. Okay, so this is showing the same thing that because of rotation, it tends the uh, a protostellar disk is formed. Okay, so now I'll just show you how do we know this is true? We have seen a number of such disk like features around young stars which are forming. Okay, so using one telescope called Atacama Large Millimeter Array, which is located in Chile, it's a interferometer that means it uses a combination of many telescopes together to make these images and here you can see they have we uh, tried to look at some of these young protostars and they are finding that we uh, they are able to even image the disk around it and in these disks you are actually some of these are spiral in shape and you are able to see small gaps it is believed that in this gaps somewhere a planet exists because as it the planet is moving around it is actually taking in more and more material leading to the formation of planets. That means it's becoming larger in size as it is moving around. It is collecting the material in its path. And that is what we believe gives rise to these gaps. So this tells us that what we have been thinking about the formation of the solar system or formation of a planetary system is same that it has the planets have to form along with the star themselves and planets have to form in a disk around the star. So now come the question of other planets. Do other are do we know of, this is of course the case where planets and stars are both forming, but are there other planets around other stars? And now we know that there are many planets, and of course it is also uh, our interest to know if there are other planets around other stars, if there is life on these planets, because we would like to believe we are not alone, right? So this is a very, very interesting and currently a hot topic in the area of astronomy uh, regarding understanding planets around other stars, understanding their characteristics and trying to understand whether life can exist on these planets. So this is one example of a Kepler 6. This what is shown below is the solar system just as a scale. And on top is a system which is a Kepler 62 system, which is believed to be similar as the solar system in the sense that Kepler 62 is the star and along with that there uh, a number of planets have been discovered five planets but these planets please do not imagine that we have imaged these planets in such beautiful resolution no these are all artistic impressions these are not because these we we can image but these are artistic impression we cannot get beautiful images like this so i just want to bring 
caution you about thinking that these are actual pictures of planets no this is only an artist impression but they have drawn the star and these planets the orbits of these planets to scale and you can see that not only do you have one or two planets moving around other stars we have discovered systems of planets where there are at least 5 to 7 planets there is even another one uh, one trap or trappist system which has around 7 7 planets so this is the trappist one system which is a star here and these are the seven planets which have been discovered around it okay and this is the for scale this is the solar system now if you look at this there there are differences between these two uh, systems first is our star is a certain yellow star but this is a red star secondly all these planets you know are very close within this much this is much closer than mercury also so people are trying to understand till now we had are trying to understand about how planets could be around other stars till now we had only the case of solar system where you know terrestrial planets are closer to the sun and they are smaller in size as you move away they are larger in size and so on but now we are finding contradictions to this kind of pictures where you are finding really large planets very close to the star also and sometimes the star is very small and cold sometimes it's large and cold sometimes it's very hot and then what kind of planets can exist these are things we did not know till now but now with the discovery of these planets we are trying to understand this because ultimately this is important in our uh, our attempt to understand whether life can exist so therefore usually what we do is we try to see how life can exist based on our definition of life so i'll come back to this aspect later so so i just want you to keep in mind here that there are three colors shown here a uh, greenish color this is reddish color which is very hot region this is very cold region and this greenish color region is is the region where the temperature is such that water can if water is present it can exist in liquid form because as you know the temperature decreases as we move away so here it will vaporize here it will be in liquid form and here it will be in icy form so this is something that people are using to be able to tell whether in that whether there is a planet in a region where water if it were there could exist in liquid form so that is known as a habitable zone now before we go into habitable zone and so on let us try to understand quickly some ways by which people are detecting these exoplanets so obviously our first thing could be let's go and image you know you look at a star and if you can see some planet close to it very good we are but it's very difficult to do this direct imaging because the star is usually million times brighter than the planet because it has its own light the planets in fact are bright in infrared therefore infrared is very good for imaging planets but even then the star is may could be millions of times brighter in infrared so what is usually done is the star is uh, the light from the star is blocked okay using some techniques in the instrument itself they will put something called a coronagraph they will mask the light from the sun and once you mask the light from the sun then you can image the other object so it's more like this you know if you're looking at the sun then if there is some aeroplane close to it suppose there is a aeroplane some distance from it from the sun but you can't see it because the light is there from the sun but for example you shade out the uh, light from the sun you will be able to see the aeroplane right close to it so in the same way you will here also if you block the light or mask the light of the star we can image the planet so this is the case of a star and a sun like star which was imaged in february 2020 and these are the two planets which are around 1.4 and 6 times jupiter masses they have even calculated the masses of these planets they calculate how much time they take to move around the star and so on so as i said this direct imaging is very difficult because the star is very bright so usually a quick method and you may not know you will keep on looking at every star you cannot keep doing this you can do it will take a long time you know masking out the star and looking you don't know where to look is the planet first is, is there a planet secondly is it close to the star or far from the star when i take a, a camera and image then will it come within that image so there are multiple issues with a uh, of associated with this direct imaging so therefore a number of indirect methods are used like eclipses radial velocity method and so on and currently around more uh, 5250 confirmed exoplanets are known and there are dedicated space missions to study these exoplanets like corot kepler and so on and most exoplanets that we have detected till now are for stars which are located close to us 
because before these stars the signals are clearer as the stars are far away from us even the indirect detection method and or the direct both become very very difficult to find out so this is one such direct imaging method as i told you you will mask out the star and you will look at the uh, planet image the planet close to it okay and uh, this sorry not radial velocity method using direct imaging method 64 planets have been discovered this way now this is the radial velocity method in this you know when you have a star planet system what happens is both the star and the planet are moving around a common center of mass so let us say i'm looking only at the star the star also moves, seems to move around the center of mass so it will at some point move away from us like now it is going away from us and then it will come closer to us so when it is coming closer to us the light will be blue shifted so doppler shift of light we use so this is known as the radial velocity method and nearly 1000 planets have been discovered in this way then there is a transit method in transit method the uh, please pardon this uh, for everything it's written radial velocity but please consider this as transit in the uh, transit method of astronomy here what we had done was here what was done was the wobble of the star we are measuring by looking at the radial velocity and here we are looking at the astrometry so this is not a uh, transit method this is the astrometry where you are looking at the wobble but you are looking at the wobble as position in the sky so can we see the star change its position slowly and this is really really very very difficult to measure as you can see so up till now only two planets have been discovered using this method then there is another method called transit this is the transit method that was the astrometry in this case what is done is eclipsing method is used you are taking the light from the star but suddenly there is a dip in the light of the star and then again when the planet is in front of it the dip is there and once it goes behind it and comes in front again a dip is there so this dip is because of the eclipsing of the star by the planet so this is known as transit method and this by far has been the most uh, successful method in detecting exoplanets so nearly 3978 exoplanets have been detected using the transit method then some as you can see this is powerful because depending on the size of the planet your transit signature will be small or large okay so you compare first one and second one right more amount of light is blocked in the second it's very small so less amount of light is blocked correct so from that we try to get to the sizes of the planets also based on the area that it covers and so on then you can have multiple planet system in fact the multiple planet system that i talked about both 62b kepler 62 and the trappist system that is detected using these transit method as you can see as each planet passes in front of the star then you will have a different signature right multiple planets means it will get eclipsed multiple times and then again it repeats second time and so on so one astronomers have to look at this signature and from there work backwards and try to see how many planets are there this is how they work towards this okay so next time move on there is also a gravitational uh, micro lensing but i'll not go into this right now it, i think i am i don't know how much time i have so i'll move on to the next one and if required we can always come back to this so the as you all know there is hey, ma'am yeah uh it's okay if you want to take some more time you can you may okay 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 no is the speed okay i just want to ask you people or is the speed okay my speed of talking yeah i think it's okay. it's fine okay so there is this uh method which is the gravitational micro lensing method in this method what happens is let us say a star planet system is there and because of the presence of any massive object the space and time around it bends this is what einstein's gravitational uh, general theory of relativity tells us that any object uh, warps the space time around it okay so this is what is seen here that this star is there this is a very distant star which is 
uh, present. And now in this warped space time, now a star planetary system is moving in front of it. As it is moving in front of it, the light rays, as the light rays from the distant star come close to this pass near through this star planet system, what happens? Because of this, there is a certain bending of these light rays. Okay, it acts as a lens and more light comes to us. That's how you can see the focusing of light. So let me show this again. Okay, so this is the, the very distant star. And here the star planet, as you see, there is focusing of light happening. And this focusing increases the brightness of the star. And because of the planet also, you can see a small blip. So using this, this is known as the gravitational microlensing. And because using this method, around 177 planets have been discovered. Now, I will just tell you a little bit about James Webb Space Telescope because this is proving to be really very useful even in this, although it has a number of science goals, one of its goals is also to understand and help us study more about exoplanets. So this James Webb Space Telescope, as you know, is a very large space telescope and it works mostly in the infrared, which is perfect for imaging of uh, imaging or spectroscopy or detection of planets because planets are relatively cooler and depending on their temperatures they emit in infrared wave bands. So here for example is shown one exoplanet around this star which is Hipparchus 65426 and here the star is masked out. You can't see the star here but what you can see is that the planet has been imaged using direct imaging method. So this is near infrared, again a longer wavelength near infrared and at mid infrared it starts becoming brighter as you can see. So you can see it much more clearly in mid infrared. This telescope, James Webb Space Telescope works in near and mid infrared and these wavelengths are therefore very good for detection of the planet. So this is one case where a direct imaging of a star planet system has been done by James Webb Space Telescope. Now, this is of course something I'm sure all of you are <laughs> would be very interested in. What about alien life? Okay, so we as scientists, of course, we like to imagine and fantasize about what must be happening. There are a lot of science fiction stories, but we like to imagine life very much like us. You know, for example, even the aliens that is shown here, apart from the fact that is green in color and all the uh, body parts are really out of proportion, we have drawn them to be. We, feel they will be similar, you know, with two eyes, two hands, two legs and so on. We don't know how they're going to be. But we like them to be similar to what we are in some sense. Secondly, when we imagine life, we imagine life as it is here. But in reality, we must be prepared for the fact that life can be in a very, very different form. Okay, even the formation. So according to our understanding, the life requires, the formation of life in the planet, for example, requires star, it is not possible because it's too hot, it requires three essential components. You need to have an energy source to drive the metabolic reaction. That means a star should be there nearby. Then you need a liquid solvent to mediate this reaction. So when you're saying life, that means reaction should occur for complex life to form. First, you have simply simple molecules and then it should become larger and larger, make complex molecules. And for example, a cell, even the simplest cell is a, a really a unique combination of molecules, right? So you need to have some reactions to reach this state. And for these reactions to occur, it is believed that a liquid solvent is necessary. That's why we think water is very important and that too in liquid form. And then you need a suite of nutrients to build biomass and to produce enzymes that catalyze these metabolic reactions. But in reality, we this is how we think it is. But we do not know and we would like to know whether there is life on other planets. So the best way we can go about this is first is look at look for liquid water. OK, so this was the first thing that people were trying to do, which I told you, right? The greenish portion of the region around the solar system. So that is known as the habitable zone, also known as the Goldilocks zone. Goldilocks zone means what? Neither to Goldilocks story you all know, right? So in same way, if you do an analogy, neither too hot nor too cold, but just the right temperature for it to have uh, water in liquid form. So here are, for example, uh, 
uh, here a plot is shown of several planets and uh, this the distance from the star and what is the temperature it has that is shown here and this is the effective stellar flux okay what is the amount of radiation which is reaching the planet so the temperature of course should not be very high earth is for example here right and this is the temperature of the star of course okay not the temperature of the planet this is the temperature of the star okay so earth and venus and mars are here this is the temperatures of the other stars so the stars that we have found and closer to the uh, closer to us which have been studied are mostly cooler stars so therefore this region represents for example some kind of planet habitability zone and for these planets we think that there is potential for it to uh, have life but whether life exists or not is not very easy for us to tell off hand so these are some potentially habitable planets based uh, and you can see what is shown here again let me again emphasize that these are not direct imaging these are all artistic impression except the solar system planets except the planets all these exoplanets are uh, artistic impression and this this uh, distance from the star uh, of the star from us is uh, shown here of the star planet system basically is shown below this is four light years you know proxima century also has a planet around it called Prox proxima century b then this is located at 13 light years from us so we are trying to see how far do we need to go to go to another habitable planet for example and this is what they have come up with all right now what this did next okay after this you can do some more and then they said let us try to look at next possible signature of life so one is of course habitability so next they said let us look at what gases are there in the atmosphere of planets so in the atmosphere of earth for example we have oxygen then we have a number of other gases carbon dioxide we have methane we have and so on uh, we have methane carbon dioxide and we have water vapor right and these in our atmosphere it is existing so the question is suppose we are able to look at the atmosphere of other planets and suppose we find these molecules there then this is a second test like yes they are very similar to earth like we do see these molecules so this is what people are trying to do next that is look at the atmospheres of these planets which is the very hot uh, topic of research now so how is this done how do you get the for this you need to get the spectrum of the spect uh, exoplanet what is shown here is the spectrum of the uh, Earth's atmosphere as the starlight or sunlight passes through it. So this is the wavelength and this is the amount of sunlight that passes through it. And you see that there are a number of absorption features. These absorption features are caused by the molecules present in the Earth's atmosphere. So here you can see water features. This is water feature. These are the pink ones are methane features. Okay, this is an ozone feature, this is carbon dioxide feature. So these features are present in Earth's atmosphere. What we would like to do is also look at the spectrum of from atmosphere, absorption spectrum of other planets. Now, as you can see, that's a really tough task to do. First, detection itself is difficult. Now I have to look at atmosphere of that planet. So this is what they do. First, they take the spectrum of the, because the, as you know, the star is very bright. So if you just take the light from the star, you will get the stellar spectrum. Whatever composition the star is made up of, that light will come here. And then what they do is, when the planet is transiting in front of it, you look at the light, or I try to isolate the light, which is passing through the atmosphere of the planet alone. So that will be a combination of the uh, spectrum or uh, of the atmosphere as well as of the star so all the light which is coming through from the star just like the sun and earth what happens is some of this light is again absorbed by the molecules which are present in the atmosphere of the planet so this is what it looks like then what you do now you have but this is a composite of the stellar and the atmosphere spectrum so what you do you need to subtract it out so you have the star plus planet spectrum and you have the stellar spectrum, you subtract it out and you get the spectrum of a planet. This, mind you, is a very, very difficult technique to do. Okay. And they have just started doing this. This has been proposed. It's very difficult. And this is just started uh, with some telescopes. And 
again let me tell you that with james webb space telescope they were able to look at the atmospheric composition of this planet called exoplanet called wasp 39b which is shown here okay so in this wasp 39b the various spectral features with the james w uh, james webb space telescope they were able to see and they found carbon dioxide features water features were also seen carbon dioxide features are seen and so on so ultimately the aim is to be able to do this for a large number of objects and also look for similar patterns do we see methane do we see uh, ozone because they will kind of tell us that it is very similar to what we see here and therefore the probability of life existing there is relatively higher okay so i this with this i think i will stop and i will say uh, to summarize i would like to say that stars are formed in dense clouds of interstellar medium and we know that they appear in different colors surface temperature and this these colors are because of the temperature and that also depends on the mass then planets where are these planets formed they are formed in disks around the young protostars that is they are formed along with the formation of stars and there are more than 5250 uh, 200 planets known currently 5250 planets and more are being detected by these various missions and then search is on for various biosignatures in order to be able to detect life on these planets so i just want to before i conclude i want to say that i have used a number of images in this presentation and they are taken mostly from the internet as it is uh, for general education so thank you for your attention and i believe we have some time if you are interested i can discuss this but Uh, maybe i will take questions first and if there is time and interest we can go to this that is if somebody wants to become an astronomer or astrophysicist what do they do how does one go about becoming this and what can we do to work towards this path so i can go on with this but i think i'll take a break take some questions and then after that come back to this aspect does that sound okay yes yeah, ma'am so I think uh, maybe we can take some questions and then. Yeah. Ma'am, we have questions in the comment box. Questions in the comment box. Yeah. Oh, just give me a moment. Hmm. Ha. Huh. Why are the names of some planets kept by numbers? Okay, I think this is the only question I see, right? Okay. So, firstly, usually the naming technique of the planets are as follows: if you, if the stars, as I said, usually the number of objects are so large you can't keep giving unique names. So we give them certain catalog numbers. Okay, like we call Kepler sixty-two. Kepler sixty-two means this uh, Kepler mission. It uh, have. I looked at a number of objects in that catalog 62 62nd entry is the kepler 62 star now if one planet was detected around it that is known as 62b if there are two planets then b and c because the star is the first that's considered a we don't call it a but it is a then you start with b c d and so on and even when you have wasp 39 and so on that's again a catalog in that catalog the entry is 39th entry so we give them names and then again the planets will be b c d and all depending on how many planets you discover around it so i hope that answers the question okay a spy uh, the galaxy spiral galaxy formation is not as simple as star formation because star formation happens on much shorter time scales and it is much easier to understand the local uh, it is very local whereas if you look at galaxies they are much much larger objects and they they formed very long ago in time okay uh, maybe very uh, short time after the big bang and that time dark matter had a very important role to play so uh, uh, while we think that broadly spiral galaxy formation should have been similar to way we understand star formation because of the disk like structure and so on but they in that case there will also be other considerations which come into picture uh because of the presence of dark matter and so on but yes there also 
the disk like feature if you are anyway any time seeing a disk like feature that means rotation is happening so if you seeing a spiral galaxy it means that it is rotating okay on the other hand the other kinds of galaxies dwarf spheroidal galaxies or elliptical galaxies they have very little rotation but spiral galaxies have a large rotation so once you have a large amount of rotation it tends to flatten up so i would not i would say broadly similar but there are lots of differences in terms of time scales when they formed and the fact that when you are talking about um, galaxies you should uh, ha or you have to incorporate the effect of dark matter okay now we are going to all sorts of questions huh? what is temperature inside the black hole i don't know the answer to that i don't think anybody knows i don't think we as astronomers know the answer to what is happening inside the a uh, black hole or what is present inside the black hole because when we talk about information anything that we know from stars or galaxies or the cosmic objects it is because of the light that reaches us from these objects so if you are not having light reaching from an object then it's simply not possible to tell anything about the object and that is the case with black holes black holes we are able to tell something about the mass of black holes and so on because the matter which is moving in uh, or is being gobbled up by the black hole is moving at such high velocities that it gives off x rays and so on and if black hole is a part of a binary system then it is possible to detect uh, to find out its mass using kepler's laws but by itself it's very difficult to find out what is at least till date we do not know how to find out also what is inside a black hole or what is the temperature inside the black hole okay what's the next question why do the gravitational waves move at the speed of light for this you need to know what are gravitational waves <laughs> gravitational uh, and why do they move at the speed of light i don't know the answer to that okay all we know that these are waves which we these are disturbances in the space time and we believe that these disturbances travel at the speed of light so if you asking me questions which require one whole lecture by itself i am sorry i will not be able to give you enough details <laughs> okay if you have questions related to what i ask i can go into more details okay these are questions which are very far from uh, my topic of but i will still attempt to answer in theory of gravity there is a topic on time dilation is that really possible theoretically theoretically it is very much possible that's why we have that one day is one month etc okay so this time dilation both the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity are proven to be very true but uh, proven to be very true but special relativity for example the time dilation and all these facts are shown to be true for subatomic particles and so on but on the scale of whether you can find a planet where one day is equal to 7 years and so on the way they show in interstellar well till now we have not found them and it is very difficult to locate this kind of things but yes theoretically we have shown them and most of the observations that we know of the subatomic and most fundamental particles we are able to explain using these theories only so this concepts are very much true only on large scale at our scale we have not experienced that kind of to be uh, to be able to experience time dilation you need to move close to velocity of light and massive objects cannot move close to velocity of light you have to be really light in mass to be able to reach the velocity of light photons are massless that's why they achieve the velocity of light so you understand there's a problem there that's why we have shown these theories to be true for particles which are moving at relativistic velocities but you can't do that for spacecrafts and so on okay it simply goes against the theory okay uh, somebody is asking about wormholes okay wormhole is a theoretical concept according to this theoretical concept you can have two parallel universes which are connected because of the warping of space time you can connect them and so on but let me tell you till date it is a hypothetical concept alone i know all of you are really fascinated by this movie interstellar my kids are also very fascinated but i have to keep insisting and telling them that these right now are theoretical concept it's like maths 
we know we can do some math but till now there is no evidence that such objects exist okay mm, what is the next question is the size or spanning of galaxies increasing or do galaxies maintain their shape like the sun okay the in case of galaxies mind you galaxies are themselves made up of stars so in the case of sun it's a very different object right because sun by itself is one entity where you have thermal pressure and you have gravity whereas once you talk about galaxy it is made up of number of stars so there are different forces that come into picture gravitation is of course there then you have the rotation motion of the galaxy plus you have the influence of the dark matter so as long as it, there is no if it has reached an equilibrium stage it will keep rotating like that but if another galaxy approaches it then it becomes mayhem you know then it starts getting tidally distorted and lots of things happen so you one cannot draw an analogy between galaxies and stars in terms of equilibrium okay uh, what is antimatter okay antimatter we think is uh, matter which has identical properties of matter in some sense but in other sense it has exactly the opposite property and one very uh, easily available example is that of positron i don't know if you have heard of this some of you may have heard some of you may not have heard so positron is like an electron it has the same mass it has the same spin but it has opposite charge okay so charge is opposite and some other properties also if you start going and looking at particle physics there are other properties also which could be different i'm not going into those details but so this antimatter and matter particles are those which have some properties which are identical let us say spin and mass but some other properties can be opposite and when this matter and antimatter come close together then they annihilate and only energy is produced okay now what is its significance in space significance is space is we see that most of the things around us are built with matter and there is hardly any antimatter around us so it leads to the question as why is there so much matter why is there not enough antimatter around us and that people are trying to investigate in how the universe formed and what happened to the antimatter and so on i don't think we have clear answers to this yet but people are looking towards this okay they say that the sun was formed from the uh, leftovers leftovers means the interstellar medium so when a star finishes its lifetime it can throw out a lot of its matter into the interstellar medium that is the leftover so when the interstellar medium is now mixed up with the matter from the previous stars enriched matter because it has been processed initially only hydrogen was and helium was there but now it's processed to carbon oxygen so that gets mixed with the interstellar matter the sun is also formed because the universe is like 13 billion years old and sun is 4.5 billion years old so it is formed from matter which has uh, interstellar matter where stars may already have uh, what do you say finish their lifetime and got mixed up with it okay so the stars become uh, okay not black hole or nebula the massive stars can become a black hole or a neutron star but the stars like the sun will become a white dwarf but this is only the core of the star the outer layers of the star are thrown out when it is becoming a white dwarf for example when the sun is going to become a white dwarf it will pass through phases called the giant phases red giant phase where the outer layers of the star will become larger larger and it will also keep losing a lot of mass and what will be left over at the center or the core is the white dwarf for massive stars stars which are more than 10 times the mass of the sun it can either uh, the end stages the a supernova explosion occur where the outer layers are thrown out violently and these mix with the interstellar medium okay so that's the leftovers from the giants and the supernova explosion and what is left at the core is the uh, black hole or neutron star in case of massive star and white dwarf in case of low mass star okay this is a very very relevant question do bright and highly luminous lights uh from city really hinder the night sky from you is yes very much so in fact when you are if you are doing night sky viewing and somebody close to you opens a mobile also it will disturb you particularly with a telescope and so you will you will you will feel a disturbance to your eye and or suppose you are seeing with a telescope if there is light leakage that will also hinder your view so the best place to view the night sky is uh, a rural place where there are no lights at all okay 
that's the best place where you can even see the milky way very clearly okay what is the temperature of the white dwarf the temperature of the white dwarfs are can be very high but remember white dwarfs are not fusing undergoing any nuclear fusions these are just hot leftovers of the nuclear fusion reactions so the temperatures can go from few thousands of kelvin 10 15000 kelvin till 80000 kelvin that is what has been measured 80000 centigrade let us call it okay i hope that answers the temperature of white dwarf when the dust could solidify to form hard planets and earth like objects why didn't it happens for ah this is a very interesting question so why are the terrestrial planets close to the sun and why are their gas giants away and why are their icy giants very far away so it so happens that in the interstellar medium there is dust particles these dust particles are mostly silicates and as you can see earth and most of the terrestrial planets are made of silicates so uh, near the sun this is known as solar nebula hypothesis how the solar system formed near the sun what happened is this matter was collecting and it was protoplanet and then it became planet but the temperature from the star was high enough that all the other elements like hydrogen helium either it went into the atmosphere or it escaped completely but these other objects the temperature was such that uh, the silicate got sputtered and became this solid dust particles came together but all the gaseous particles were either got trapped within this or they completely escaped so it is the effect of the temperature gradient away from the star now as you go away you see that so therefore the four closest ones are the terrestrial ones but as you go away you see you have gaseous giants there it is in the form of gases not even ice because the temperatures are such that you have gases there and if you go further it is solid solid form of the because the temperature is very low so this whatever we see is the effect of the temperature and the amount of the stellar radiation that is reaching that location okay possibility of other life form in other universe see i don't know about other universe so i can't tell you about other life form <laughs> but i we don't know what it could be we think it's very similar to us unless we find it it will be very difficult for us to comment on it only we must be aware that it can be very different from what we think that's all i would like to say why are more what are which are more space stars or planets okay so as of now we have done a sampling of only regions very close to the sun and we find that every star most stars have planets so you have a large number of planets around these stars so we think that there are a large number of planets around stars but we have not sampled the full galaxy also only close to the sun few stars we have seen now just imagine from this statistics if we extend the statistics to the entire galaxy you would expect that there will be a really large number of planets and therefore you would expect that the, then the probability of life being present doesn't appear very small because now the number of planets becomes very large right and why is it as you can see take the case of solar system you will form one star but the number of planets around it can be many that's why we expect more of planets than stars is multiverse you possible it is possible theoretically observationally there is no um, observationally or from evidence there is no proof that this multiverse should exist it is only a hypothetical right now when you say hypothetical it's only maths and therefore fiction currently Uh, what are the other theories other than big bang okay so other than big bang big bang for the formation of the universe i think yes somebody wants to say something okay for the uh, other than big bang right now big bang seems to be the most plausible formation mechanism for the universe i am i am not sure i am fully aware about other theories the reason why i am also not very sure about the other theories is the fact that big bang is supported by observations other theories may not be so big bang we, we know is possible because all the galaxies are receding away from us i hope this doesn't lead to further questions so please let us not take too many questions on this arena 
you can have separate topic separate talks for this to help understand this topic so therefore i see most of your questions which are not related to the topic that i asked it requires a lot of time for me to explain but in that process if more and more question comes it will be a never ending process i think you need to have more astronomy talks that's all i can say so one uh, is the fact that uh, is in support of big bang is the galaxies are receding away from us and other is we they have detected some uh, radiation everywhere which is known as cosmic microwave background radiation which can only be explained by the process of big bang so let's just say it that way then but this is how the universe started off but the question is how it ends is it going to expand forever is it going to come back there there is confusion some believe that it will expand forever then theory show that it can again after reaching some large size it can start contracting again and become very small and come to a point and so big bang can keep happening multiple times and so on and some people feel that the universe is steady and it will remain so so these are the uh, various possibilities about future of universe but about the past of universe a big bang is the strong contender what is a multiverse possible i don't know as i said it's a theoretical concept i think i took that up okay can you tell us more about significance of dark matter okay the significance of dark matter is the following is that dark matter first you should know what dark matter is then we can talk about its significance the dark matter is something which does not give off electromagnetic radiation but it has a, a, a gravitational effect so if you see all that we know about the uh, astronomy galaxies stars whatever we know about the cosmos is because of the presence of the light or electromagnetic radiation which is reaching us but if the electromagnetic radiation is not reaching us then there is some matter whose gravitational effect can be felt but we are not seeing enough light so let us say you are looking at a galaxy then the, you find that the rotation at the edges of the galaxy is so high we should indicate that more amount of mass should be present but if i look at the light of stars and do some rough calculation i find that the mass is very less then where is that extra mass which is causing the gal outer edges of the galaxy to rotate so fast so that is where the concept of dark matter comes in and we say that there is some matter which is present we don't know what it is but we know it has gravitational influence because the outer edges of galaxies are moving fast because of the presence of this matter so this is its significance and then if you actually calculate how much mass is there in galaxies and so on it's an it's a huge amount okay a very small fraction uh, a, a small fraction of it is in the form of the ordinary uh, or light matter the dark matter is a very large fraction is there any possibility of two planets sharing one orbit that has to one for that we have to look at the dynamics of the system it depends on how far they are whether they are stable or not because there will come a time when they may all be in line for example if they are not in line it's fine so there will be gravitational influence of all this so if it is in a steady form one has to check whether it is possible to have this then it you will have to put constraints on the masses of the planet the orbit of the planet to be able to say whether this is possible or not so off hand i'm not able to tell but this is an interesting problem that one can try to solve using dynamics okay somebody is talking about stephen hawking the concept of time in which he said that we will know a future first then our past if the universe contracts how far is it? look i will not go into these details now because for this you will need to understand what he is trying to say you need to understand that theory and then go into understanding special theory of relativity to be able to answer this so i am not going to take this up now due to lack of time okay i think these are all the questions we have for now so if you have any more questions related to the topic that i spoke about i'm happy to take them okay okay i i think we are done right yeah organizers i think we are done hello yeah yes ma'am 
Hello. Yeah. So I am done. Yeah. Okay. Anita, uh, are you here? Ah uh, yes. So now I invite Gauri to have a session with both of them. Is the meeting over? I mean, can I leave? Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Ah yes. Is the meeting over? Can I leave now? Ah uh, wait. Ah, uh, can you please wait? Yeah. Someone has rightly said gratitude springs from a heart brimming with the feelings of thanksgiving and gratifies both the giver and the receiver. Good evening to all. Myself Gauri Pavadi from GEC Idki. First and foremost, I extend my sincere thanks to Dr. M. J. Jalja, principal of GEC Idki. By her contribution, we are able to make the event what it was. Now, on behalf of Ende Nova family, I extend most sincere gratitude towards our chief guest, S. M. T. Sarida Vik, professor of I. A. S. T., who spare her valuable time to grace this occasion, ma'am. Your words was well enough to acquire more knowledge in the field of space. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Last but not the least, I would like to mention my deep sense of appreciation to each and every one of you for being here with us today. Once again, thank you and have a nice day. Now, participants can leave the session. Thank you. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. Thank you. Uh, I will be providing the feedback form in the uh, chat box. Everyone should feel that, okay? Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, ma'am. 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 Everyone need to fill the form in order to get a certificate. So please do fill the form. <laughs> 